Hey, this is Pastor Ty, and we want to thank you for joining us at Cowboy Junction today. Uh, when you hear this message, we want you to know that we've been praying, and praying that your faith will grow and be encouraged and challenged, and we really want you to know that we, we love that you're here. But what would help us is if you would subscribe, rate this, review this, and, and share it online. You can also help us by partnering with us. And a lot of people call Cowboy Junction home that attend on our online campus. But when you join us financially, you're really being a part of the team. You can easily give a one-time gift or set up a recurring gift at cowboyjunctionchurch.com backslash give, and uh, that'll help us so much. Uh, thanks again for being here, and hope you enjoy this message. Good morning, everybody. How are we this morning? Well, if the, the girls did a great job, didn't they? The acoustic worship. Well, in case you're wondering, and maybe this is your first time at Cowboy Junction, you're like, what is going on? I didn't even know women were supposed to stand on stage, much less lead worship and preach. Well, um, thank God my husband believes in the, the beautiful women of, of Cowboy Junction. Um, but our men are coming home today. They've had their Create Men's Retreat in Colorado. So right now they are driving back, and uh, they've entrusted us to lead the service today. And I know that God said that he would pour out his spirit on all men and women. So um, we're believing today that God is going to speak in a mighty way. If you have your Bibles today, or if you don't, it's going to be up on the screen. But if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Exodus. We're going old school today. So we're going to be reading out of Exodus chapter 16, verse 11, starting in verse 11. Where we're going to be uh, um, starting today is the children of Israel have left Egypt. They've crossed through the Red Sea. They have now been one month in the wilderness, and food supply is running short. And so now they're grumbling. How many have ever wondered what is wrong with the children of Israel? They grumble so much. But you know what? We're not too different than they are. Um, so many times I want to judge them, but when I have to take a mirror and look at myself, we also have so many times in our life that we do not recognize the miracles that God has placed right before us. So here we are in 1611. It says this, the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight, you will eat meat. And in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God. That evening, quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. Then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Today, the title of my message is The Battle to Trust. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you once again. You are here. I can feel your presence. I know that you have set this time for something special to happen. I thank you for the word that you've placed on my heart. I thank you, Lord, that you're going to give me everything that I need to say to deliver the truth behind your message today. Open our hearts to receive. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And all God's people said... Amen. How many battle trust? Trusting God. 
believing that he will do what he said he would do, believing that his promises are yes and amen, and not just for those people, but for me also. You know, from the very beginning of time, we can see through scripture that mankind has struggled with trusting God. There's a need inside of every single one of us to control. I don't care if you're type A, if you're type B, if you're a lion, if you're a a gopher, whatever they are, every single one of us have some sort of desire to be in control. The children of Israel feared that the manna would not be there tomorrow, so they saved some. Even though instruction was given, take only what you need, one omer per per person, and eat it all. And trust that tomorrow there will be fresh manna. Do you and I do the same thing? We want to control our situation. We want to hold on to what we think we need because we're not sure if tomorrow the same blessing we receive today will be there waiting for us. God wanted to show his children that he could be trusted. He would supply all of their needs for each and every day. And he did this for 40 years Every single day, when manna appeared that first day, a month into their journey, it appeared every single morning until they walked into the promised land 40 years later. God has proven himself over and over and over again to his people that he is faithful and he is worthy of trust. But it's also interesting to me that hundreds of years later, Jesus comes on the scene and the disciples ask Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. And you all know this scripture, but I'm going to read it to you in Luke. Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray. And catch this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread. Jesus, it was even reminding him, this was not just for the Israelites to take today the bread But Jesus was also teaching us that you and I are to every day trust God that he will give us the bread that we need for today. That he will be faithful to show up not just today, but he'll be faithful to show up tomorrow. If he said it, I can count on it. I can trust him that he will bring to me what I need. And the thing is, Jesus was called the bread of life. We're not just to ask the Lord to provide our physical needs but we're also to ask him to provide our spiritual needs. Jesus is the bread that you and I eat of today. We are able to go and get a fresh word. The spirit of God, the word of God is what feeds our soul. And every single day, Jesus has promised, if we seek him, we will find him. He will not only feed you physically, he will also feed you spiritually. Our unchanging God wanted his kids in the wilderness to know that they could be, that he could be trusted. And then he sent his son to remind us that we need to depend on his father daily. And even today, you and I can learn and remember that God is worthy to be trusted. An interesting fact, in case you didn't catch it when we read in scripture, manna is the English word for what is this? They had never seen it before. And isn't that what we do too? We have an idea of what God should do. And God brings in a miracle in our life. And we're like, what is this? What, what is this? How is this part of your plan? We've got to figure it all out. Anybody in here that likes to figure it all out? Know how you get to the finish line from the starting gate? That's how I live my life many times. But God says, I want you to trust me day by day. Take in what I've given you today and don't fear that tomorrow you won't be provided for again. So this leads me into my first scripture, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. So Steve uh, told y'all that I have a devotional out there for sale. And the reason I'm selling them today is because I just sent my new devotional to the printer on Tuesday. So come create my brand new devotional is coming out. And the title of that devotional is called created for more. I believe that God has created us for so much more than we recognize that he wants to do so much more in each and every one of us. But the subtitle to this devotional is living a life of purpose while trusting God's plan. Now, I have a confession to make. This devotional is everything that I know to be true, yet I'm still learning to live it out for myself. So when you read it, don't think I'm telling you what to do or how to live. I'm giving you truth that I'm still trying to swallow. Things in this book I know are exactly from the heart of God, but it's not to say that I'm living it out perfectly myself. 
Knowing something to be true and living like you know it is true are two totally different things. I believe every single thing that this book says. I believe it to be true. But living it is a little bit harder. I know it to be true, and I can encourage you to live it out. But living it out for myself is a whole lot more difficult. So just to be honest and to stand on this stage, I'm not telling you today that I have it all figured out or I know what to do or I'm living this perfect life because I've found the secrets to what the Holy Spirit's wanting to show. Every single day, I am learning to fall in love with Jesus. I am learning to trust him. He's asking me, Heather, know me and trust me. Know me and trust me. If I'm not knowing him, there's no way that I can trust him. I have faced many battles in my 42 years of life. I'll be 43 in August. And some of them I had no control over. And that's the series that we're in right now is battles. And many of you are saying, you know, y'all are giving some great tips, some great tools. You're showing us some scripture that, that can really help me in a lot of areas of my life. But there's some battles that I have faced that I have no control over. I, I did not make them happen. I did not step into them. So I'm not trying to discount some of the battles that you may be facing right now that you're trying to navigate through that you really had no understanding of how you got there. But there are some battles today that I want to talk about for me personally that I have actually played a part in. I've experienced these battles because there's something going on deeper inside of me. And the battles that I've been facing are merely symptoms of a root. And so today I want to talk to you about just a couple of things just to give you a little bit more of my mess of a life, the things that I struggle with. But when I was a little girl, I had a huge fear of dying. I can remember laying in my mother's lap with an awful headache. And for me, it wasn't just a headache. There had to be a brain tumor. <laughs> I mean, I went from something small to something of great magnitude. There was a fear of dying. Although I knew Jesus even as a little girl, I remember laying in my grandmother's bed at the age of five years old and her talking to me about heaven. And I started to fear going there because she kept telling me forever, forever. <laughs> and so I laid in bed, I laid in bed thinking about forever, forever, for, and I got so overwhelmed with fear, like when will it end? I don't know if I can stand something forever. But my small little mind back then didn't understand the goodness and the plan that God had for my life. But fear was something that I struggled with. It was a battle that I faced for many, many years. And it didn't necessarily stop because 10 years ago, I faced one of the biggest battles of my life. And I've shared the story, so you may have heard it before. But for those of you that haven't, I was walking through Walmart one day, had a full buggy of groceries. I was overwhelmed. I had a lot on my plate. Many things were going on in my life, but nothing too, that I thought was too much. How many feel like you've got it all together until something happens and you realize you were uh, just one thread away of unraveling. I'm pushing this cart through Walmart. No children in tow. I had two at the time. Uh, they were both born. But I was pushing the cart through Walmart, and all of a sudden, I felt like my heart stopped. Like, I can't even describe it. If you were here when Carlos spoke, uh, he shared a little bit of his story as well. I literally thought I was dying. I went to my knees in the produce section next to the cucumbers, and I called Pastor Ty, and I said, something is wrong. He, I'm going to get emotional today. Um, he called the, the manager of Walmart to come and find me. My mom and dad came up there because they were closer to get to me, had to help me check out of the grocery store to, get, to be able to even leave. Um, went home, laid down thinking, okay, I'm, I'm a little better. Woke up with a panic attack from my sleep. Um, dealt with that for a couple of days, and then it went away for a year. And then one night I went to bed and woke up with the, like, like, I can't even describe, I became plugged into an electrical outlet. And for the next six months, energy flowed through my veins like something I've never experienced before. And I dealt with anxiety. I could hardly have Ty even leave me. For two weeks, I had to go live with my parents so my mother could feed me. It would take me an hour to eat an egg. I mean, I'm the pastor's wife of Cowboy Junction Church, and I am facing something that I've never before experienced and never thought that I would. Anxiety had taken a grip on my life. So then worry was also a battle I dealt with. I'm such a weirdo at times that Ty and I went to a jazz concert not too long ago at um, the, uh, New Mexico Junior College. And we got in there and the crowd was so small 
for this jazz club that had the, this jazz group that had flown in from all over the world to come together that I sat there so nervous for them to walk out and see how small the crowd was. Ty's like, what is wrong with you? We're on a date. Just enjoy. But I'm that type of personality that I don't want anybody to be embarrassed. I don't want anybody to not feel valued. And so I'm sitting there worrying about what these guys are going to think when they walk out and they see a small crowd. This is a battle, a battle that I face all the time. Health issues, undiagnosed symptoms. Like I told you before, headache, it's got to be a brain tumor. Anger. Yes, this sweet little girl right here can get angry. Why? Because I expect perfection. I grew up believing that things needed to be perfect. My house needed to look perfect. When I was going through my anxiety attacks, I never left my house without my bed being made. Y'all, God has done a miracle in me. My bed has not been made since the last time I washed the sheets, okay? <laughs> right now, you can walk over to my house and my bed is unmade. But I lived a life of feeling that everything had to be perfect, and not just for myself, but even for my husband. I expected him to be perfect. And when he did not meet those expectations, this tongue can be very sharp, believe it or not. With my kids, when my kids were not being perfect, anger could rise up in me, frustration could rise up in me, and my tongue could be sharp. So those are just a few of the battles that I have faced in my 42 years of living. But what I want you to know that God has shown me is that those are just merely symptoms of a root. And the root is a lack of trust. The root is that I don't trust God to provide for tomorrow, so I have to figure it out today to make it happen. And that is a lie from the pit of hell. Just like a weed, if you don't get the root, new growth will appear in time. You may get rid of the battle you're in right now, but if you don't deal with the root, you will go around this mountain again and again and again. And it may come in the form of different battles, but it will still be a battle nonetheless. You have to find out what am I struggling with and what is the root cause that I truly need to grab a hold of and give it to God and ask him to heal in my life. So, that's my introduction. I will move fast. But four things that I want to share to you, with you today that I have learned in the battle to trust. Four things. Number one, control is merely an illusion. Control is merely an illusion. I've always blamed my issue with control on my type A personality. But God recently showed me something very important. Either he is in control or I have given control to the enemy but I am never in control. God is either in control of my life or I've handed control over to the enemy. And guys, I don't want the enemy to be in control of my life. I want my father in heaven who holds this little ball of gas in the atmosphere and you and I are walking on it instead of floating. I mean, does it, the creator not blow your mind? We get, we get on a plane not knowing who the pilot is, not knowing what inspections have been done on the plane, and we trust that it's going to get us from point A to point B. But we can't trust the creator of the universe who shows us his glory and his goodness in everything that we see, that he holds our future and he has our back. Trust has got to be something that we give God, but we also have to give him control because you are not in control as much as you think that you are. My papa used to let me ride in his lap in the back roads of Louisiana and drive the steering wheel. I really thought I was driving that car. But he was always in control. And God gives us a sense of, you can do this. I believe in you. I've put purpose in you. I have a plan for you. But he's in control, whether you know so or not. Number two, you won't trust him. You won't trust God until you know him. And you won't know him until you seek him. God's character and his promises must become second nature to you and I. We sang about it this morning. They even closed out worship by saying it. God is good. God is our provider. He is a promise keeper. He is a good gift giver. And he's the creator of life, not death. Now, I was late to the game in believing these truths. And I'll tell you this, I've known the Lord my whole life. I'm one of those kids that I cannot tell you the day I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I cannot tell you the day that I uh, was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't remember those specific dates. It's as if I've always known. But I didn't really know 
who Jesus was in the sense of what his character was. Because I was the type of person raised in a very strong religious church that if somebody got sick, what did they do wrong? Um, God's good until you do something bad. God loves you until you don't do enough in the church. And I was raised that way to believe a false God, not the true God. And it's only been in the last 10 to 15 years that I've truly began to take in. But I'll tell you, once you start to believe a lie, it's very hard to undo that lie. So it may have been 10, 15 years ago. I may have been in the ministry now for many, many years. Before Ty and I were even married, I was leading a college and career group. Um, I was the little girl in elementary school, took my Bible to church and had kids follow me at recess, telling them how to get saved. Go home tonight, and when you go to sleep, pray to the Lord and ask him to come live in your heart. You know, I didn't know I could lead them right then and there, but that's always been a part of my life. I knew the formula, but I didn't know the Lord. I didn't know the truth of who he was. And the thing is, you can't trust him if you don't know him. You can't trust him if you don't know the truth about him. And so we've got to get in our heart who God truly is and allow the unwiring to take place of the things we've been taught in the past. He loves me, not because I do something. He loves me because I'm his. He has a plan for me, even when I screw up and take a fork in the road that wasn't his best, I have a God of second chances that can bring me back onto his perfect plan. One of my favorite verses is verses that reminds me of how good God really is. And the reason I even wrote the next devotional created for more is Ephesians 3.20. It's one of my favorites. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, that is at work within us. When I got a hold of that truth that God wants to do more for me than I can imagine, blew my mind. You know, I always was afraid that I was being selfish if I asked God for something. But God says, you have not because you ask not. He says, I want to do more for you than you even think for your own life. But also, I felt like I had to make it happen. And the scripture reminds us that it's not by my might, It's by his power, and we have to allow him access into our life to allow his power to go to work inside of us. He doesn't just want to heal your body. He wants to make you whole. I'm reminded of the 10 lepers that Jesus healed, but only one came back, and the word says that one that came back and thanked Jesus was made whole. You know, leprosy does things to our body that we don't even understand. Things fall off. God didn't just heal them. He made that man whole. And that's what God wants to do to us. He doesn't want to just save our marriage. He wants to anoint our marriage and our union for ministry. He doesn't want to just provide for us. He wants to fill us so full that our vats overflow that we can bless others with what God has given us. Why do we forget how good God is? Why do we forget how faithful he has been? been and continues to be in our life. If you were here three weeks ago when we started the series Battles with Carlos Whitaker, he said something that I want to repeat today just to refresh your memory or to tell you for the first time. The volume of life must decrease so that the volume of heaven can increase. Why do we forget? Why do we forget about God's goodness and God's faithfulness? Because we get busy And we don't slow down long enough to hear the voice of God in our life. The volume of life must decrease so the volume of heaven can increase. And so a friend of mine just recently said the acronym for busy, being under Satan's yoke. We think that we're being good people or very active people and doing a great job when we can tell someone, oh my gosh, we're so busy. We're doing this. We're doing that. My kids are here. My kids are going there. In all actuality, what we're saying is that we have no time to slow down to hear the voice of the Father. So when we face a trial or a storm in our life, we're so overwhelmed because we're trying to make it from point A to point B and get our kids there safe and unharmed. But busy is not something to be proud of. Busy is something that needs to be changed. We can be active, but are we being active in things that are actually eternal and not temporal in our life? I went to Africa a few years back, and the thing that I loved most about that experience was the stillness that I was forced to experience. No cell phone service, no electricity, no bathrooms. Can you imagine this? No bathrooms, two weeks. 
Days in Africa were longer than normal. I swear the sun stayed in the center of the sky. We had a whole moment, like in scripture, where the sun stood still because the sun never went down. My days were longer. I learned to love tea with a little splash of milk and a little bit of honey as we sat around the campfire. We had face-to-face conversation. Y'all know what that is? Face-to-face conversation. We took long walks into the nearby villages. And there was such poverty there, but they were so in love with God. Many of them were. We, we reached some unreached people that had never heard the name of Jesus, but we also met people that knew the Father. And it floored me one day when we came upon a village And we asked this man that knew the Lord very well. I said, can we pray for you? And he said to me, we pray for you. You have everything but God. We have nothing but God. And that spoke so much to my heart because I realized I sat there pitying them feeling sorry for them, thinking, oh, if I could scoop them up and take them on the plane back to the United States, they would love life. How can they be happy in what they're living in right now? But they pitied me because I have everything but God. And they have nothing but him. And he is everything. He is all we will ever need. I sat there and looked at their their bin that was full of corn. That's what they ate all day, every day. They would mush it. They would corn on the cob. I mean, they, they did what they could. Goats were running around. Pigs, I swear, y'all should read my journal. Laying in my tent at night, I heard donkeys, cows. I mean, we couldn't sleep for nothing because of all the animals they had around. But they were happy, and they wanted to pray for me. We've got to be still. We've got to be still and lower the volume of life so that we can increase the volume of heaven. What has your focus? Is it stuff? Is it lack of stuff? I know for me many times the lack of stuff grabs my focus. How do I get more? Giving your kids every opportunity but forgetting that what they need most is you. You know, we pat ourselves on the back because my kids in dance, my kids in football, my kids in basketball, my kids in baseball. We are on the traveling bowling team. You know, we have this list. If I'm giving my kid every opportunity, but has your kid had any time with you? Has your kid had any time seeing you at peace and being fun and joyful? Or are you yelling, get in the car, where are your shoes? Did you forget your your glove and bat? But we're being good parents because we're offering all these provisions for our children. I'm sorry, most of our kids are not going to grow up to be professional baseball players. But they need to grow up and be professional good people that love others and are kind. I have so much to preach in so very little time. Here we go. Moving on. Number three, God has a plan, and it's better than mine. God has a plan, and it's better than mine. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Proverbs 16, 9. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. I want to testify for a minute. I have tissue for two reasons. One, I've been sweating really bad. And number two, I'm going to probably cry in this portion of the scriptures uh, that I share with you today. But I want to testify to you right now that God's plans have always been better than mine. Always been better than mine. And usually they're different than mine, completely different. And I want to give you a couple of testimonies. I graduated from high school at 17. I was a young gun, went straight into college, graduated with my registered nursing degree at 20 years of age, Uh, did clinicals through nursing school, trying different areas, loved the OR, thought I would love babies, um, doing uh, labor and delivery, didn't enjoy it, but I loved the OR. Left after graduation, went on a mission trip to Mexico. In August, as I was coming back from my trip in Mexico, I got a phone call. I had said, you know people tell you never say never. I had said, I will do anything, but I will not do pediatrics. I hated my clinicals of pediatrics because you couldn't take care of the kid because the parents were little hovering hens, you know? So you felt like you were having to counsel the parents more than be able to take care of your patient. And I just said, I will never do pediatrics. Pull into the United States and I get a phone call. My job opportunity was to come and do an interview for a family of a six-year-old little boy who had cerebral palsy. I was like, God, you are funny. 
I said no to pediatrics. I went on that job interview just to please my mother who said, you need to at least give it a shot, try out your interview process, see how it goes. I felt the Holy Spirit so strongly in that room that I said yes that day, and 23 years later, I am still saying yes to that family. He turns 29 in, uh, um, in November, and I've been with that little boy ever since. God's plan was bigger and better than my plan, and I would not change it for anything. I've not worked in any other area of nursing than pediatrics taking care of this kid, and his family, and he have blessed my life in more ways than I can tell you. My marriage, I'm going to be a little honest with you guys. Ty was not my plan. (laughs) This could seriously be a book And I don't know who would buy it and read it, or I would be writing it right now. The Lord's going to have to open the door one day for the floodgates to come out. But Ty and I have an incredible, amazing story of how God's plan is better than our plan. I had a guy in mind, and I said he was the one. And we had planned who our bridesmaids and our groomsmen were going to be. We knew the colors of the dresses and the colors of the ties. And God said, my plan is different than that. And he brought Ty being in a miraculous story that if I had more time than six minutes or 10 minutes, I would tell you. But today, this church is on the property of my ex-boyfriend's family. (laughs) I am raising my kids in my ex-boyfriend and his brother's bedrooms, okay? God's funny, (laughs) But God's plan is perfect. For eight years of our marriage, I was asking God, why did you make me do this? I honestly could not look at a Valentine's Day card and mean anything that those cards said. Because I married Ty out of obedience, not out of love. And I asked God many times, is this it for me? Am I just going, am I not going to get to experience being in love and being excited about this marriage for eight years. I can tell you today, I love Ty being more than anything in this world. And he is everything to me. He is the man of my dreams. And I can not read a card and it'd be good enough to give him because he is so much more than anything words can say. But if I would have gone with my plan, I wouldn't be where I am today. God's plan is always better than our own. Now, my kids, I have a plan for my kids, y'all. They're to be A students, top of their class like I was. They're to go on to college after graduating from high school, get a good job, Marry a beautiful woman from a good family. Give me two to three grandchildren each and live within 10 miles from me always. (laughs) That's my plan, okay? I also, in my plan, I said I will never homeschool. Okay? Here we go again. Never say never. I am homeschooling my two boys. This is my first year to be homeschooling both of them. Neither of them will graduate with a high school diploma, with the curriculum that I'm using right now. I'm having to trust God that they will be able to take their entrance exam to New Mexico Junior College, and they will become college graduates. But I know that I know that God has called me to do what I'm doing. Three years ago, my youngest was diagnosed with dyslexia, and after many meetings with the teachers, they told me, he's got to have something different than what the public school can offer. And here I was going, well, then who is that? And what is that? Because I know it's not me. But God's plan was different than my plan. And is it hard? Oh, my gosh. The hardest thing that I've ever experienced is not only to, I love to teach, and I'm very smart. I'm not trying to toot my own horn. But I love math. I love history. I love it all. What's hard is being with my kids 24 hours a day. I could kill them sometimes. (laughs) But I know this is what God has called me to do. And I know that God's plan for my kids is bigger than my plan for my kids. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
couple of weeks ago, Melody Tavelli, one of the young ladies up here that sings on the worship team, she closed out in prayer. And when she prayed the most beautiful prayer I've ever heard, I just broke and I wept when she said this. She said, no devil in hell and no plan of man can stop God's plan. I'll say it again. No devil in hell and no plan of man can stop God's plan. If I seek him, if you seek him, you can't screw this up. Will we make mistakes? Absolutely. I make them every single day. I threaten Brady Bean that he's going back to public school every single day. <laughs> but God has a plan, and I'm seeking his face. And the word tells me that when I trust him and lean not on my own understanding, he will make my path straight. When I make a mistake, his grace is big enough to cover my mistakes. His grace is big enough to cover your mistakes. But seek him with all of your heart and trust him and know that his plans are better for you than your plans. I needed that day when Melody prayed to be reminded that God Almighty, God is Almighty and that he's got this. He doesn't just have my life. He has my kids' life. They're not even mine. They're his anyway. I'm just a steward called to obey his voice, to guide and direct them, and to love them, and he'll take them where he wants to take them. Fourth and final point is this. What have I learned in the battle to trust? There is pain in the process. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not delivered from the fire. They were delivered in the fire. And many times in our journey to learn to trust God, we go through difficult times the other morning, I, I, don't, I know y'all have heard Ty talk about CrossFit. Well, I've joined the dark side. I was sick. It's been two years. I was tired of hearing about it. And there were just, I was like, I need to start feeling better. Um, I need to expend some of this uh, stress energy that I have towards my children. So I need to exercise. So I went to the dark side and I joined CrossFit. And I will tell you that every, well, I shouldn't say every. Well, yes, every. Every inch of my body hurts five out of the seven days of the week. I'm not kidding. Five out of the seven days a week, my body hurts all over. And my mother asked me the other day, she said, why are you doing this? And I realized that I'm going to hurt one day or another. I'm either going to hurt now, but be proactive in working my body to be fit, or I'm going to hurt. I mean, I was already starting to hurt. Hips hurting, knees hurting, couldn't bend down for very long. I mean, don't ask me to bend down to talk to somebody because I can't get back up. You know, I was starting to get there, and I realized that I, I have to be proactive in getting better. And that's what I've realized, too, that life is not always going to be easy, and there's going to be times that it's painful but it doesn't mean that God's not in the middle of the pain. To build a strong marriage will take time and may hurt, but I can trust him. Waiting on God's best can be agony, but you can trust him. Losing someone you love can crush your soul, but you can trust him. Storms will come, but we don't need to fear the storm. We just need to run to the, the rock that is higher than I. Even though pain is part of the refining process, God has promised us that we will have joy and peace in the middle of it. Our theme for Create 2019 is hope, holding on to hope. And our scripture is Romans 15, 13, the final scripture for today. It says this, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is the God of hope because we can confidently expect that he will fulfill his promises. If God said it, you can count on it. That's why we must know the word. What has God said? What has God said about me? What is God's plan for my life? We may not know the exact time of the fulfillment, but our hope is a confidence that it is on its way. How many of you would agree we're all searching for joy and peace? Every single one of us are searching for joy and peace. Yet we've confused happiness and calm waters as joy and peace. Happiness is just a temporary satisfaction of a, of a pleasant circumstance. However, joy can be experienced even when our current situation is bleak. The world does not understand true joy. How can you be in a very difficult time 
and have joy. It's because true joy can only be understood when you have a relationship with the Father. And one of the most hated scriptures of all time, and I forgot I have this scripture, is James 2. And mo- many of you don't even ever read this one because you don't want to be reminded of it. But James chapter 2, verse 2 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be, be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Everything you go through is to make you complete and mature, not lacking anything. And that process can feel painful many times. But joy can be experienced. Peace is also misunderstood. We think peace means that nothing wrong is going on in our life. But did you know the calmest place in a hurricane is in the eye of the storm? A hurricane, a storm can be raging all around you. But in the Father's arms, you can have peace even when things don't look good on the outside. Peace is not the absence of a storm, but it's resting in His arms. The key to hope, to joy, and to peace is to trust. That scripture says, you will receive joy and peace as you trust Him. Trust Him, joy and peace will come. Trust him doesn't mean you'll have all the answers, but joy and peace will come because you know that his promises will always be fulfilled. You don't have to search for joy and peace. He'll bring them to you if you just trust him. And then the last part of that scripture, he not only fills us, but he fills us so that we overflow with hope so that we can share the hope that we've been given to those around us. What you've gone through, what you're going through is not in vain. Nothing is wasted in God's economy. When you trust God through your storm, he will fill you so that you can be a testimony and a witness to all of those around you. You you will overflow with hope for the world to see that God is good And God is good all the time. And if it's not good yet, God's not done. Because he will finish. He will complete what he has started in you. Can I pray for you? Father, I just thank you for every single person in this room today. I thank you, God, that all of us needed to hear that we should trust you. All of us needed to be reminded of what your scripture tells us, that you are for us and not against us, that you have a hope and a future that's more than anything that we could ever ask, think, or imagine. Father, I just pray right now for every person that is going through a battle, going through a storm, and feels like it's just too much. I just can't hold on any longer. Father, I pray that they would hold on to you and be reminded that they can trust you in the middle of the storm, that the calmest, most safe place to be is in the very eye, and the very eye is in your arms. And as they trust you and lean on you, I pray that you fill them so full of joy and peace that their eyes no longer look at their circumstances, but they're fixed on you, the one who will get them through because your promises are yes and amen. If you're here today and you would say, Heather, I want to trust this God you're talking about, but I don't even know him, much less am able to trust him. If you're here today and you would say, Heather, I need to ask Jesus to become the Lord and Savior of my life. I need to give him access to my heart. If that's you here today and you would say, would you pray for me? Pray that I could receive him to be able to give him my life. Would you just raise your hand right now? Anybody? Amen. Father, we thank you for every single person that's here today. We thank you that what you have started, you will finish. We thank you for the storm that we may be in right now is only temporary, but you are forever. You are eternal. God, we love you. We thank you and praise you. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Cowboy Junction, go ahead and stand to your feet this morning. 
Our prayer team is up here. Steve and Kyla and anyone else that's on the prayer team can come up at this time. If there's just anything you need to pray about, if there's something that you're in the middle of right now, a storm you may be facing, that you're just like, you know what, I need someone to agree with me. The Word of God tells us where two or three are gathered, there He is. And I also said earlier, He says you have not because you ask not. And sometimes when we can join with someone else in agreement, it not only does something in heaven, it does something on the inside to know you're not alone. There is someone believing with you and for you. So if you want to stick around for a little bit and receive some extra prayer, they would love to do that. Pastor Ty will be back next week for Mother's Day. Bring your moms. We're going to have a special treat for all the moms here. Uh, have a wonderful week. God loves you. Jesus loves you. Don't you ever forget it. Let's love God, love people, and have no limits. Amen? Amen. Have a great week.